Excellent. Yeah. We won't forget. Well played. Oh. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We will get started here in another minute or two once folks have had a chance to get into the main Zoom room. Hi, Kristen. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Do we have Justin yet? I don't see his name in the list. Hang on, guys, the lab people coming. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks to everybody who's just joining in. I think we're going to give it one more minute here. We're, I believe, still waiting for one of our speakers to join in. Um, but if he's not here shortly, we'll go ahead and get started. And Sorry, guys. All right, well, we're at two after, and I know we've got a lot of ground to cover, so why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this joint event of the Association of Field Ornithologists and the Wilson Ornithological Society. We're going to be talking today about safety in the field, and we're really glad that you've found this topic important enough to, to be with us here today. Um, my name is Ariel Fournier. I'm the second vice president for the Wilson Ornithological Society, and we're, yeah, really, really pumped. Um, I'm gonna turn things, I believe, over to Jen next. Okay, cool. I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Um, all right, let me know if you can see uh, a bunch of slides. Hang on, there's a bit of my start on the first one. See it? Hey, good, that's good. I haven't failed automatically, good. All right, well, again, I just wanna echo what Oriel said. Um, we're really excited to have all of you here today for this joint event between Wilson's and the Station of Field Ornithologists. Uh, as Oriel said, we're gonna focus on uh, field safety today. Uh, we've got a great range of different people to speak to you from all different types of perspectives on field safety and also first aid. And so um, I'm representing the Association of Field Ornithologists today. And I just wanted to kind of give a welcome on our behalf. So we are the um, Association of Field Ornithologists. Um, if you notice the dates, it's our centenary years. So we're 100 years old this year, which is like a really exciting thing for us. Um, so what do we do? Um, oh, and I should just say, this is our new logo. So for all of you who voted on the um, logo, thank you very much. Here's the winner. Um, really, really excited to release this this year. So what we do, uh, studying conservation of birds and their natural habitats, we bridge between professional and amateur ornithologists. I'll just admit people as they come in. And we have a really strong focus on Latin America um, through outreach, scientific meetings, and we have numerous grant programs, especially those for students. So take a look at our website and find out um, a bit more about those. So we um, also own um, Avinet research supplies. So all of you who are buying mist netting equipment, banding supplies, et cetera, um, this is a company that AFO oversee um, in coordination with the management from BRI. And so I um, encourage you to, you know, get ready for the field season, get all of your banding supplies and head over to Avinet to make sure that you are ready for, um, yeah, doing, doing all of your field work this season. One thing that I wanted to highlight was um, an initiative we have at the moment called AFO Cafe. This is a series of informal um, meetings and conversations that we're having in which AFO invites um, ornithologists to give seminars and we welcome all of you to join. Uh, it's a really informal chat. It's kind of a nice Friday afternoon thing. Um, for me, you know, 
COVID in terms of seminars have been pretty limited. So this has been a really, really good way to keep up to date with exciting science, um, which is going on in the realm of ornithology. And so our next cafe is going to be Emily Troy from McGill University in Canada um, with a titled talk, Arctic Marine Predators as Sentinels of Environmental Change in Marine Ecosystems. So go to our website, register for that event. Um, it's going to be uh, a really, really cool um, talk there from Emily. Uh, the other thing to highlight right now, as I said, it's our centenary um, year, which is great. Um, in a celebration of that, we're holding our annual meeting in our birthplace, so where AFO started up in Massachusetts from the 10th to the 13th of October 2022. Um, if any of you have been to our meetings, we often host them with Wilsons, but this time we're doing um, AFO by ourselves. Um, and it's really um, excellent community, really friendly, kind of a smaller, a smaller ornithology uh, conference. So please um, join us, it'll be great to see you there. Um, and then just to, to, to finish off, if you want to learn more about AFO, um, what we do, who we are, opportunities for you to contribute, and we welcome people to, to take part, um, please visit our website, um, which is listed at the bottom there. And also uh, there's information about membership. So membership's cheap, it's $20 for students. Um, you can, through membership, you can support professional and amateur ornithologists, access discounts to banding supplies through our company, Abinet, and uh, have member only access to events and grants. So with that, um, I'll hand over, are we gonna do anything more for Wilson's right now? Or do you want me to kind of get on, just go on into safety stuff? I would go right on into safety stuff, Jen, thank you. Okay, all right. So I'm going to pull up uh, another presentation that I have got here. And so um, I'll start off by saying that there's gonna be um, a lot of points covered by everyone who's speaking today. So there may be um, some iteration of points, um, but that really showcases how important they are, right? And so, um, yeah, just, just keep that in mind, but there's some folk who are gonna talk a bit more about um, field safety from a perspective of doing it in a rural area. I'm going to focus much of mine about doing field work in urban areas. So to kind of just put things in kind of the context of myself and the lab, my lab. So with a Smith lab, we're at University of Texas at San Antonio. Um, we broadly do work to look at the mechanistic um, impacts and um, the effects of global change on wildlife, mainly birds, but other taxa too. Uh, I have a bunch of graduate students. Um, my lab is really active, really big. We work in all kinds of um, different environments that could pose uh, safety issues um, across urban gradients, um, remote areas without cell phone, out of country, in country, um, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, a whole breadth of different things. Um, more recently, a lot of my work is focused in urban areas, which is why I'm kind of giving this perspective today. And so one thing I've been speaking a lot to just Jen, can I can I interrupt you for one second? We're yeah. still seeing your AFO slide, and I thought you had some other slides. Interesting. You know what? I will figure that out and do that. Thank you for letting me know. No problem. That would have been embarrassing if you just kept going and talking. I mean, me, but it's great. Thank you, Oriel. All right, so can you now see my Smith Lab slide? Yes. Awesome. So this is like, like perhaps more relevant and kind of makes a bit more sense. Nice. Okay. All coming together. Yeah, it's all coming together. Um, so, um, so yes, so I won't go over the words I just said, but um, this is um, my lab um, here in UT, uh, UTSA. We do lots of things focusing on urban um, safety today. Feel free to reach out uh, to me anything about any of this um, at any point. So um, I've been speaking a lot to um, Jess and Oriel and the kind of community that we've established to talk about safety in, I guess, the last year now. Um, you know, I've been graduated from my PhD in 2011. I've been doing field ecology for probably about 20 years now. And as we spoke about this, I was like, hey, I've never done field safety before. And that's a really alarming thing, given I've worked in so many different places uh, and so many different environments. And I have, I won't disclose, but I've had you know, a lot of safety incidences. 
And so now that um, I PI, I feel an ethical responsibility to ensure that my students, students in my lab and, and my team um, are well prepared to go into um, field work uh, in a way that they um, know how to navigate safety challenges and understand what those safety challenges might be. And so kind of starting at the beginning, when my students and um, when I was with my students, the, the team and um, we meet regularly, um, we talk about safety, we talk about experiences kind of in this shared um, this shared system, as you will. Um, they teach me as much as I teach them, which is a really good um, kind of structure we have. And one thing that I really want to stress um, is um, the importance of um, some recent papers that have come out which we're discussing as lab. And, and these are just two papers that I find very useful for my students to look at. And I wanted to highlight them here. Uh, so there's one by Laurie Daniels and uh, Susie Lavelli, uh, which is very much focused on the different things to think about when you're doing um, safety. So there's typical things that you might put in a safety plan. And then one recently by uh, Amelia, Amelia Demery and Monique Pipkin, um, which if you haven't read, go out and read it. Um, it's uh, a very um, useful paper for all many, uh, all kinds of reasons. And so moving on from that, uh, we discuss papers, we talk about um, different instances, different um, concerns, and all students and all people in my lab team are all required to write a safety plan. Uh, before they go out in the field. And these are living documents uh, informed by all kinds of things that might go in the field, um, but there's some basic things that we think about. So again, some of these might be iterated in other conversations today, but um, when we write those field safety plans, um, some things that you, you would like, you need to think about when you're writing these things are field sites, location and description, a brief description of the research, uh, who your team members are, in your field team and the contact information for them. It's also useful to know um, who has had first aid training, right? Um, I always recommend having someone who's got um, relevant first aid training for the places that you're going. Who's a team lead also, which leads on to communication plan. Who communicates with who? What is the order uh, in which people communicate in, in a sense when you have um, some kind of safety um, issue? Emergency contact information for the university, police, other, uh, where appropriate, the itinerary, where you're going to be, when you're going to be there, uh, details of the nearest hospital, uh, contacts for those things too, description of the physical and mental demands, you might be working a really long day when you're required to focus, um, and that can be draining mentally, right, physical, are you climbing a mountain, are you in the desert, and then we go on to talk about risk assessment, right? And there's all kinds of different health hazards, safety that can occur in the field. It could be from those traditional things we think about, poisonous plants, whether venomous wildlife. Um, but I also, uh, and we also collectively discuss things like people, people danger. And as we'll come on to say, that's really relevant potentially in urban, urban areas. Um, and then also things like, have you got enough water? Shade? Is there enough shade? Which again, is a relevant problem in urban areas that we don't really think about. Oh yeah, and then strategies for controlling risk is a big one, I should, should forget that. So what do you do if there's a safety issue? And then some more kind of um, other considerations which might be relevant depending on where you are. So for example, I have friends who do things like dark bears. They may be not relevant to urban areas, may be relevant to urban areas actually, um, but an understanding and a written note in your safety plan of what those immobilization, immobilization drugs are. Um, I absolutely know people who shot themselves in the foot with a dart and had to go through the processes of understanding how to deal with that. So if you're doing something with drugs or um, those kind of things, know what to do if you um, face a safety hazard, either yourself or a team member. Uh, in some cases, you're in a remote place, an evacuation plan, right? Um, certainly I've done field work involving a remote areas, um, flying helicopters, those kind of things. What happens if something goes wrong, especially if you haven't got cell reception or access to a quick get out route? And something that is really rarely spoken about, but it's really important, is um, insurance details. This kind of goes back to the helicopter idea. Unfortunately, there's been increased instances of helicopter crashes and other things, um, which often 
aren't covered under university insurance. And so, um, and I've learned this through experience. I've not been in a crash myself. I know people who have, um, but moving forward, I think it's always uh, important for teams to have a clear and, and um, transparent uh, agree, um, conversation about what that insurance is, because that seldom happens. And then um, details how to contact uh, emergency responses if you're out of cell range. And, and things like, do you have a sat phone, for example, if needed? Description of the first aid kit, where it's located, um, and also uh, paper maps and compasses. Uh, a lot of my students are like, why do we need this? We have our cell phones, and then we get to Southern Arizona, and they're like, my cell phone doesn't work. So um, we go through a lot of those trainings too, which is really important. Um, and then depending where you are, understanding what PPE that you need. We also discuss um, broadly as a lab um, code of conduct. Um, that is a living document that's not necessarily created by me, it's created by the team and we talk about that and what the repercussions for breaches are and the correct procedures for um, dealing with a code of conduct. That's really important too. And so let's think about urban systems, right? Um, when I first started talking about doing something to the urban systems, a lot of folks said to me, well, what's different about urban systems compared to rural areas? And why are there a set of different risks here? So some things, this is London, by the way, I'm using this as a place from home, right? But um, some things which immediately pop out to me are the, obviously the built environment, right? And so this is poses a lots of different unique challenges. Some are relevant to rural areas, but they're perhaps um, exaggerated in urban areas, right? And so there's a lot of people in urban areas. Um, so there's increased interaction with people when you're doing field work in those areas. So um, there's potentially, right? I want to say potentially, not always, but there's potential for increased risk of physical attack, right? Harassment, aggressive behavior, and discrimination simply because you're interacting with more people. It's increased crime rates, oftentimes, and increased interaction with folk. Oh, that's another point, sorry, I was saying increased interaction with folk interested in what you're doing. So this isn't necessarily a bad problem, but certainly something to think about. I do a lot of uh, things like banding in urban areas, and there's always tons of people who want to come and see what we're doing. And that can be good. Um, it can also pose some challenges, um, potentially safety challenges. So understanding the implications of that are important. Um, increased road traffic and density of roads um, is also one to think about. Um, so increased risk of uh, traffic accidents, not only when you're driving, but also whilst you're on foot. So thinking about that is important. And then um, potentially increased risk of zoonotics. So urban environments is certainly characterized by increased densities of urban adapters, certain species of wildlife, such as raccoons, peri rabies. This is just one example, but being aware of the zoonotics that urban habitats um, uh, can provide um, is important. High density of domestic dogs. Um, this is something that we have to navigate a lot. We do a lot of um, social science in-person surveys too. And so we, we're always um, aware of dogs in gardens for sure. Uh, unusual tripping hazards, um, sidewalks, paths. Uh, you might not think this is something to think about, um, but I've had, I know lots of people who <laughs> tripped over um, yes, yeah, sidewalks um, and uh, experienced sprained ankles, for example. And then increased um, uh, risk of air pollution, exposure to contaminants, waste, aspergenic noise, right, uh, et cetera. And then weather. Um, so the urban environment can be up to 10 degrees hotter than rural areas. And so the urban heat island effect can definitely um, ha have an effect on a, on a hot day for sure. Um, oftentimes, uh, there's reduced shade from trees, and because of impermeable cover, there's an increased risk of flash floods. So being aware of those things is really important. So what can we do to start navigating some of those challenges, right? Um, and this is something that is um, relevant to rural areas too. And I also want to stress there's some things in here that I haven't included because they're broadly applicable to um, all field work. So there might be some things missed here, but I've concentrated on ones for urban areas. I uh, always work in pairs, check in, have a check in, check out buddy system. So we use um, numerous different methods. We have um, 
group me, et cetera, in our lab, where um, whoever's doing field work in the lab checks in and checks out. We have a buddy system, right? Avoid working at nighttime in urban areas if possible. But if you're working at night, um, use a high visibility attire, a vest, for example. Uh, and that might be appropriate during the day, depending where you are. Wear appropriate PPE if exposed to, for example, high levels of noise or pollution. Um, this is a general rule uh, we have in the lab of never enter someone's house if they uh, invited you in. Um, sometimes you can establish relationships with if you're working with community members um, over a long period of time. Never, but as a general rule, we say never enter people's house. Um, I know, I mean, I, I have done it where I built, you know, um, solid relationships with people and entered people's house. But as a general rule, I would say don't enter people's houses. Never enter a property if there's signage that suggests that you might not be welcome. So, for example, no tr trespassing, no soliciting. Consultation with the local police. Um, this, I've had mixed uh, effects of this. I did this in San Antonio recently and the police were like, who are you? What are you doing, birds? You don't need to phone us. But when I've worked in smaller communities, they've really appreciated it and wanted to know that information. Um, report safety issues immediately following your communication plan. So establish a communication plan of who you're going to contact and the different scenarios, right? Um, and this involves uh, including um, um, reporting safety uh, issues um, centered on breach of code of conduct to you. Um, always have a way to escape close, close by. Um, as a general rule, I encourage students to move their vehicle if they're going to travel a long distance so they know where their vehicle is so they can get a, a quick getaway if needed. Um, be prepared for increased urban heat, uh, lots of water, those kind of things, right? Check the weather before you go out. It's a general rule for field work. Don't go out if um, there's going to be weather related risks associated with urban areas, for example, increased um, risk of flash flooding. And park your vehicle in a way that minimizes risks. There's increased areas in urban areas um, where there's um, uh, ways you can block escape routes, um, driveways, et cetera. Um, just uh, be very cognizant of where you're parking. And also in a way that means that you don't have to navigate traffic yourself. All right, so going on to that, avoid areas of high traffic. Uh, know where the local hospital is. Um, another thing that's useful that we found is putting a sign on our dashboard to basically say who we are, what we're doing, why we're in your neighbourhood. Um, some students in my lab um, do carry personal alarms and event sprays. Uh, I encourage you to do this if you feel comfortable and, and that's something you want to do. It's certainly something to think about. Uh, be familiar with basic first aid or have someone on your team who is familiar with first basic first aid. Um, kind of the bottom points here are to me some of the most important. If you feel unsafe, escape, you are way more important than data. data. And don't let anyone <laughs> tell you otherwise, okay? Trust your instincts, be aware of your surroundings and be prepared by creating um, a lab safety plan, a safety plan for your field work. Cool. Um, so I listed some resources here. I found some great resources out of the UC system in California. Um, simple thing to do is Google how to write a safety plan. There's so much information on the internet about doing that. I just wanted to give a plug out to a, a chapter that myself and some folk are writing for the upcoming Wildlife Techniques Manual, which um, I think some of you others are uh, involved in this book. We're not sure when it's going to come out, but watch this space. So that will come out hopefully in the next um, couple of years, right, Oriol? Anyway, yes. So um, that's, yeah. So that's all I've got. Um, reach out if you've got any questions. But I think I'm going to hand over to Jess now, who's going to talk about rural safety. I think or, I'm um, next, and then Jess. But sweet. Yes. Oriol. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to hand it over to you. I'm going to stop sharing. Perfect. Hand it over. Um, I don't have any slides, so you guys are just going to listen to me chat for a few minutes. Um, so I'm going to be talking about some things to take into account from doing field work in a rural perspective. Um, and I just want to emphasize what Jen talked about, which is that a lot of this comes down to thinking through things ahead of time and communicating within your team to have a plan. Um, it's much more difficult to deal with emergencies 
um, as they're happening and figure out what's supposed to happen. It's, it's much better if you've at least had some level of um, thought going into things ahead of time. And so um, I'll you know, reiterate as well what Jen said about having a check-in and a check-out system. Um, and in, in addition to having like a system by which you check in and check out, especially if you're doing solo field work, there should also be a plan for what happens if that person doesn't check in. Like what is the next thing that then happens? Do you, is like, if, if my person doesn't check in, do I then have to go out and find them? Do I call someone else? At what point does like law enforcement get involved with search and rescue? Like you should have like a multi-tiered plan, not just like, oh no, they didn't check in. Now I don't know what to do. Um, the kind of two big things I wanna talk about in terms of a rural setting is that, especially if you're working on public lands, it's incredibly important to be aware of what hunting seasons are happening. If there is hunting occurring on those public properties, um, this can be really important for knowing how you need to prepare yourself. Um, if for instance, you need to be wearing blaze orange, but also in thinking about what times of day or perhaps times of year you should or shouldn't be in certain parts of the area. You may also need additional permits to be in certain parts of public lands during hunting season depending on how um, the presence of people is managed on those properties. Um, so also one of the things that's better to try and get ahead of ahead of time than after the fact is um, talking about with law enforcement, whether that's county sheriffs, local police departments, or conservation law enforcement officers, which can be federal or game wardens. Um, they're incredibly important people to have kind of informed about what's going on so that they can respond in an appropriate manner if someone reports that you're out doing weird stuff out on the refuge or out, you know, whatever it is that you're doing. This can be especially helpful for nocturnal work. Um, if you're working with local, state, and federal um, biologists or scientists, they can probably help you figure out how best to um, communicate that information to law enforcement, um, and that can be a really helpful thing as well. Um, one other thing I'll mention in terms of rural settings is a little bit of it is learning your rural setting and figuring out how best to communicate to the people that you encounter what you're up to. In some situations, having big placards on your vehicle that say like university or USGS or whatever can be really helpful because that helps people to like recognize who you are and what you're doing. In other instances, those can be invitations for people to come interact with you in a non-positive way. And so knowing your environment um, and maybe getting some magnetic ones made so you can take them on and off depending on where you are. That is what I did in my PhD. In some parts of the state, we put the magnets on and in some parts of the state, we took the magnets off. Um, and so there is unfortunately a little bit of trial and error there as well. Um, and my other piece of advice, and this is coming from someone who did almost exclusively nocturnal work for my PhD is always know who to call in the middle of the night if the gate is closed or your truck is stuck. You don't wanna be figuring it out on your own at two in the morning. So make sure that not only do you have a plan for if there's like a medical emergency, but also for like, I'm stuck and I can't get out emergency. Um, and I'm gonna turn things over to Jess, who's gonna talk a little bit about the remote work angle, and then we're gonna hear from Justin. Okay, um, so I also have a few points on here um, to share with everyone, but we wanna turn it over to Justin soon, so I'm just gonna fly with it and emphasize some of the differences that I've found in working in really remote conditions. And some of the differences in these remote um, field sites compared to urban and rural areas is just the, the isolation point. And this can be, you know, in the US or in other countries where you're working. And, you know, if we're in more urban or rural areas, we might be able to get to certain places for, um, you know, medical help or supplies if something goes wrong. But oftentimes in these remote settings, that isn't always an option. Um, sometimes it can take hours or even days to get back to any point of civilization. So I, I found that one of the, the most important things is, um, as Jen and Ariel have uh, emphasized, that having that plan in place is really important. Um, and that plan can be, you know, knowing your best route to get out of these places, who you can call for evacuating, what your nearest hospital is. Um, some of the, I'm just, I'm going to go through these slides quick so we have them there on the recording and you, you can go back and review it, but uh, we're not spending a lot of time on it. Um, 
In terms of being isolated and having plans for evacuation, there are some travel insurances, as is mentioned, that have um, evacuation insurance built into that. So if you end up needing to be taken out by a helicopter, that's available. Um, in some field sites, the local military bases have been uh, great options for potential evacuations because they have those resources. Um, and then just being prepared, having all that, all those supplies that you would need to be as self-sufficient as possible. So that means, you know, whatever you can do in terms of communication devices um, and first aid. Some of these areas, they might have a, um, a cell phone network that you can access, but only through a local SIM card. Uh, so it's, it's useful to ask people around there what network works for them. There are spot devices for emergencies that you can carry on you that will send out a, a message um, in case you get into trouble. Those are great because they, you can pre-program messages and you just need to be in an area where you have satellites so you can get that signal out. Um, and then satellite phones I have used uh, that can be handy when you're truly remote and you need to check in regularly and you know, get weather updates that might not be available. Um, so those are options as well. Uh, some other things that might be a little bit different, you know, you, if you're going into a place where you didn't, you're not that familiar, just uh, casually walking around in, then there might be different wildlife um, problems that you might not think of. I didn't think that elephants were going to be a problem until I got over to Borneo and then they were like the number one concern. Um, for some people working in places where there, there are moose and bears, I know I'm probably more concerned about the moose at this point. So it's just being aware of the different wildlife um, encounters that you could have there and, and which ones are actually going to be problematic. And that will change from site to site. Another one, another big one, especially if you work in the tropics, are um, potential um, diseases uh, that you can get. I guess they're these tropical diseases like malaria or dengue, um, mishmaniasis, uh, that you have to be aware of, know those symptoms, and, and try to be as uh, careful as possible with these different preventative measures. Also, when you're traveling outside of the country for that, the CDC lists a lot of resources for um, what you need in terms of vaccines and if it's an area where you need to use anti-malarials. Um, and then just to reiterate Jen's point in terms of weather, um, oftentimes you're in a place where you can't actually check the weather forecast. And so being prepared for it all. And it was really hard for me to call bad weather days and like lose a good day, a field day. Um, but I did find it be better safe than sorry out here, especially since you might not be very close to seek shelter. So um, those are just some of the specific things that I found for working in remote field work. And I'm not going to belabor that point too much because we want to turn it over to Justin, who is um, Dr. Doroshenko. And I first met him taking a wilderness first responder course back in like 2014. He was the instructor. I needed to take this two week course uh, because I was fixing to be responsible for a bunch of students in a really remote setting. And I learned a ton on that course and actually ended up using those skills. Um, with the students that I had. Now, Justin actually has over 20 years of experience with outdoor leadership and education, and he was a paramedic for 11 years. Uh, he has a master's degree in outdoor education. And bef before he even became a doctor, I found Justin to be incredibly knowledgeable. Um, as the, <laughs> the woofer instructor that I first met back in 2014, but since then he's just continued to level up. And, now he's a graduate of the University of New England um, College of Osteopathic Medicine and a fellow at the Academy of Wilderness Medicine. And he continues to serve as an instructor trainer now. I guess the students don't get him, that's the trainers that get him for instruction. Um, and faculty for the Knowles Wilderness Medicine. And we're super lucky to have him here today to talk about how we can be safer doing field work in terms of preparing for medical emergencies and, and stuff like that. And I will turn it over to Justin. Awesome, thanks Jess. Um, everybody hear me okay? Cool. Um, well, thanks for having me, first of all. Let me flip over, share screen. 
And cool. Everybody got that? So yeah, that that intro that uh, it makes me sound very busy um, over the year. So I, I do appreciate you having me. And, and when Jess kind of said, you know, will you, you know, talk to us about something? I, I really didn't know which direction to go because I mean, I want to hop on here and like talk about you know, train you how to do medicine and like teach you all sorts of cool stuff. And unfortunately, the the, the nature of medicine just doesn't really allow that in a lot of cases. But um, I'll, I'll try and give you some info that I think will be helpful. Um, there was a lot of really good information from all three of the folks that already talked, in, in, in my opinion, about just readiness for, for you know, field settings. Um, but yeah, there's, there's me, there's a few of the organizations that I'm, you know, tied into. Um, now, I, I will fully admit, I know, I know nothing about ornithology. I don't know anything about birds. Um, and so I, I, I think I, my crazy brain goes, okay, field safety and ornithology. And so like, this is, this is where my brain goes. Um, and so I was like, oh, well, how do you prepare for that? But that's not actually what we're, what we're going for. But um, I'd be curious to, to hear everybody's rant about, you know, portrayals of birds and moose and the birds aren't real thing. That one's one of my favorites. And I just kind of want people to talk about that at some point. But um, anyway, um, this actually, you know, starts off nicely because I mean, really the, the essence of kind of preparedness um, in any sort of field setting or austere setting, we, we use a lot of those terms interchangeably, but wilderness setting and remote setting, austere setting, like they all kind of mean the same thing. They're basically you know, sometimes we describe it as you're in an area with a patient where you don't want to be for longer than you want to be. And that's, and that's basically wilderness, remote, austere medicine, field setting, et cetera. Um, and in terms of like being prepared for stuff, you know, there's the, there's the classic list of the, the, the 10 essential items. And it's a really reductive list. And it says like, you must have these 10 specific things. And it's really kind of grown from there to incorporate the essential systems. And so if you just, you know, you can look up, you know, you can just Google the essential systems. Some places will have 10, some places will have 12. Um, but, you know, you really touched on, on a lot of those things. I was, I was writing a couple of notes down, like having the navigation stuff, the communication, like, yeah, you go to just a different state and your cell phone plan isn't as effective. Um, you know, having, you know, if you're especially in, you know, whether it's an urban setting or a rural setting, like having proper illumination, um, you know, having a headlamp, having a way to, to light your way. Um, you know, nutrition, hydration, making sure you have food and water, um, insulation when it's appropriate. Um, and kind of think of that as, you know, I need to have something just in case, not necessarily like I'm making sure that I'm wearing what I need to stay warm, but something in addition to that in case I get stuck in a bad situation. Um, you know, shelter slash protection like takes on a lot of different forms for some places. It's like having some sort of shelter actually above your head. Um, but it also includes like sheltering yourself from the elements. So if you're in a very, um, you know, uh, mosquito, you know, and disease prone areas, like making sure that you have some sort of shelter from that, be it bug nets and repellents and, um, you know, permethrin and those sorts of things at a time. Um, if you're in a uh, tick country and how can you shelter and protect yourself from them with wearing long pants and long shirts and all the pre preventative measures there. Um, fire starting, you know, sun protection, you're talking about like being, you know, in the remotes of the desert or in Africa, you know, they're you know, recognizing that sun protection comes in a variety of different flavors and being prepared for the appropriate one for the setting. Um, repair, I'm sure that y'all carry a ton of equipment with you and making sure that you have equipment to repair stuff. You know, on the original list of 10 items, it'll just say knife. Um, and that's not enough. Um, you need to have repair and not just like, this is the repair kit I have, but I need to have repair for all the different things. You know, a classic one for an overnight, like say camping or backpacking trip is being able to repair like your inflatable sleeping pad. And a lot of people just ignore those things. And then with myself as a medical professional, certainly having first aid equipment, and we could spend an entire half hour on building a first aid kit. Um, and so I don't want to do that. I think in the end, it comes down to, and I think a lot of, a couple of you already mentioned it, like researching your area. That's going to be most important. You know, Jess was talking about, you know, spiders and snakes and all those other little weird creepy crawly things that come up when you're going to international locations. Luckily, in North America, we don't have a, you know, terribly high burden of, uh, of venomous creatures, but certainly in some areas, it's worse than others. But just thinking about as you're, you know, 
building some sort of field safety kit or preparing yourself for the beginning of field season, like going through and just like, yeah, Google the 10 essential systems and just kind of see like, do I have things that meet this in some way, shape or form? And this of course varies depending on the context, location, how long you're gonna be out, how remote you're gonna be. Um, so uh, here's my disclaimer, and that's that I, I can't teach you medicine over PowerPoint and Zoom despite what medical education nationwide has thought for the last two years. Um, and this in no way replaces proper training. I have to say that um, with that being said, I do want to give you some useful information since you invited me. Um, and I think a lot of it just comes down to like the, you know, the awareness. And, you know, if you've taken a, you know, some sort of wilderness medicine course, um, Jess, I should have left this blank and had you fill in the five parts of the scene size up. Um, but seeing awareness is always one of the one of the biggest things um, of just knowing like whether something has actually happened or whether there is actually a patient or whether you're just like in case something does happen. I recognize that I'm in a high risk area or a high risk situation. Like these are the things that we go through classically. The the five components of a scene size up. It's sometimes called, and it's really going like okay, like a concept of how safe it is. And we're gonna talk about safety more in a second. Um, you know, some sort of understanding of like, if there is going to be, or there has been an injury or illness, like, where did that come from? How bad was it? Um, folks have talked about PPE in terms of like the, you know, the, you know, chemicals or things that you're using, but, you know, personal protection, just in terms of gloves for, you know, having hands on other people who might be sick or injured. Um, certainly being aware of the number of people and the number of patients and always the, uh, the risk for multiple patients. You know, somebody mentioned, um, lightning and, and, and the effects of thunderstorms and lightning, unfortunately, has a, a really bad rap for affecting a number of patients um, all at once. And the idea of general impressions, sometimes we give the, the question of what's the vibe? Like, what, is it, what does this feel like? Does it feel like this is a really big deal? Do I feel like, I, and this is all dependent on your level of training and your level of preparedness, certainly. So something that is, I might think of as like an emergency physician, like I think is relatively minor, might feel like a bigger deal for you. And so you have to get an understanding of what your general impression of the, of the scene is. Um, but I want to dive into safety a little bit more. Um, and this is, it's a concept that kind of, makes some people uncomfortable. Um, sorry, I just flew into Colorado Springs. And so I'm a good solid like 7,000 feet higher in elevation than I'm used to. So I'm going to get dehydrated very quickly. Um, but this concept of safety third, this is, um, some people are familiar with this because of Mike Rowe, the guy from Dirty Jobs used to talk about this on his television show. But a group of us took this and moved it into a sort of medicine rescue wilderness environment kind of thing. And it's really getting in the sense that you know, you're going off and you're doing field work in, you know, potentially like, you know, seemingly semi-dangerous urban situations, even, even um, in, in rural areas, in wilderness areas, international locations. And if safety were truly the first thing on your mind, you wouldn't go there. Um, and so this like, concept of safety third is not to diminish the importance of safety, but it says that at the bottom, like it may be the most important thing, but it's not the first thing that I consider. That the most important thing with when you're going out and you're doing field work is really is getting the job done, because that's the whole reason you're going there. Um, and for my friend Wooten uh, Jones, who's an uh, emergency physician in Greenville, North Carolina, um, he has a, a really thick Eastern North Carolina accent. And, and so he says it much better than I, I am, but he, uh, he says, is the juice worth the squeeze of like, you know, safety can't be the first thing on my mind at all times because I've got this job to do. I've got to go out and, and, and do whatever this, this, this job is in the field. And is it going to be worth it for me to go out there? Is it worth it for me to accept some of the hazards and some of the risks that come with going to that environment to be able to get this job done? So the, the number one is, is getting the job done. Number two is satisfaction because you can't have satisfaction without safety. You can't have, you can't get the job done without safety and, and vice versa. And so making sure in a big scheme, you know, a grand scheme of things and on those individual, you know, ventures into the field, like you need to make sure that people are feeling satisfied with what they're doing. They're getting some job satisfaction. They're getting enjoyment. They're having fun. Um, even if it is the type two fun where like it kind of sucks in the moment, but it's fun to talk about later. Um, and then, of course, with safety third, the third thing being safety, like we're always monitoring for it. It's still very important. We don't want to create, we're creating relative safe environments. Um, and so just a concept that I just wanted to kind of put in your brain something to consider um, to kind of get rid of that idea of like safety first, like safety is important, but it's just one thing. Um, and then in thinking about like, I was sitting here going like, all right, 
there's so much to this topic. Like, what can I reinforce or encourage you to go after, encourage you to think about um, in 20 minutes on, on Zoom? Um, and that is like, okay, well, at bare minimum, like, let's not let people die. Um, and, you know, and so thinking through kind of what a lot of folks know, if you've taken any sort of even basic CPR course, you know, the airway breathing circulation stuff is really the most important stuff. And when in doubt, if something happens, you're never wrong by just making sure that those things are okay. Do they have an airway? Is their mouth open and empty? Are they breathing? And are they pumping blood inside of their body and not really outside of their body? So in the spirit of that, you know, one of the most important things that, you know, I'm sure a lot of you already have is this idea of, of a basic life support training, a CPR class. Um, and again, like I'm trying to sum this up, if you remember nothing else, just if somebody is unconscious and they don't look like they're breathing, just find the middle of their chest and push on it really hard and really fast. That's how you do CPR. Um, as a reminder, in case you just need to remember, if you're like, oh, I remember to do CPR, but what are all those numbers? Well, remembering to compress 30 times and then give them two breaths and just keep doing that um, and making sure you get some help. If you haven't taken a uh, basic life support or, or CPR course before, I highly, highly encourage you to seek that out. Um, if you're employed somewhere that's sending out into a field setting, it doesn't require you to have that. Like sometimes I call those like job red flags um, of like, don't work there. But uh, American Heart Association, American Safety and Health Institute, there's a bunch of really good ones, good ones out there. I encourage you to, to seek out that training. Um, another one that is maybe not as, as well known, um, but bleeding control. I mean, you're in a field setting, there are unpredictable things that happen. You know, I, I don't know how much you end up working around like power tools or folks that are doing tree work and things like that. But I do know that there are a lot of birds that live in trees. Um, and so maybe, maybe that's a situation. I'm kidding. Um, I mean, I do know that, but the, this is another really good training to, to seek out. It's really short. Um, it's called stop the bleed. There's the website if you want to look for it, but it talks about just the basics of if somebody is bleeding out, how do I stop that from happening and understanding of tourniquets and understanding of how to, um, you know, pack bleeds and things like that. And it, it's always in the past has been thought of as this like, oh, this is a worst case scenario. Like, oh my God, like if putting a tourniquet on somebody, like, you know, they're almost dead. And it's like trying to dispel some of those myths. So like, this is legitimate first aid that a lot of us believe that everybody should know. Um, so another good resource for you to, to check out. <clears throat> and then the last thing I wanna mention, just because it's something that's important to me, especially when you're off in these remote settings. And again, it's kind of like, kind of like trying to pull back on some of these old myths about like, oh my God, like an EpiPen is this just like life or death situation. And if I give it to them, I could kill them and like stuff of just like, let's roll that back a little bit. So with anaphylaxis, we're talking about the severe life-threatening allergic reactions. <clears throat> and the important thing is to recognize that this is happening. And so there's some signs and symptoms up there. Like somebody gets, you know, I think in your settings, a lot of time you're thinking about flying, stinging things, the hymenoptera. It's most commonly not bees. It's more often wasps and hornets. Don't blame those poor bees. Um, but don't forget about fire ants because they do it a lot too. And, but like large areas of swelling to the face or the tongue, people who are kind of having these like gaspy two to word, you know, two to three word cluster sentences, somebody who's dizzy or fainting and um, an, a largely unknown one to a lot of folks is having a sudden onset of like abdominal cramping and vomiting or diarrhea. Um, but recognizing those things and realizing that epinephrine is the thing they need. Like, don't be thinking of Benadryl as the thing that treats severe life-threatening allergic reactions. But this is one of those, like, hey, at bare minimum, we should, like, keep people from dying. Like I said, that's kind of baseline for us. Um, and so uh, speaking to the safety of epinephrine, it's a very safe medication. Um, in many countries, it's available over the counter. Um, and I think that there are just a lot of myths and, and misunderstandings out there about you know, epinephrine being this incredibly dangerous drug because you have to inject it into somebody. But um, if you are unfamiliar um, with, with that, there's a lot of epinephrine training available. Um, it's something that me in my capacity with one of the places that I work, um, we do a lot of anaphylaxis and epinephrine training for folks. There are um, in North Carolina and California, there are layperson epinephrine certifications where you can get a uh, basically a certificate to have epinephrine prescribed to you to administer um, even as as a layperson to somebody who's experiencing anaphylaxis 
Um, but my contact information will be at the end of all this nonsense. And you, I encourage you to reach out to me if you have more questions about that, or if you have questions about trying to figure out a way to get epinephrine into your field kits or your first aid kits for an organization that you work for. Um, we're, we're quite passionate about making that happen for folks as well, but don't be afraid of EpiPens. And there's also the one I threw up there as well, the AviQ, which is the one that talks to you. It's like the, um, the, you open it up and it just kind of guides you through the process, but yeah. Um, the last thing I'll say is just that you should also get some real training because this is not real training. This is exposure and this is a little bit of knowledge. Um, and, and really the thing I'd recommend for, for where y'all are operating, my understanding of that um, is proper wilderness medicine training. So just gave a, a wonderful endorsement of the wilderness first responder course, but you know, that's a big commitment, nine to 10 days, 80 hours of curriculum. Um, it's a lot, it's exhausting because somebody who teaches them like, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot to, to give up um, in terms of time and money. Um, even more accessible will be a wilderness first aid course. Um, and really the point of the wilderness first aid course is two day courses to give you the ability to do patient assessment, because that's the thing that I can't teach you over Zoom. And that's the thing that you really need to know how to do in terms of how to approach somebody who might be sick or injured in one of these settings. Um, it gives you a basics of how to assess a patient um, and some basic, you know, field improvised stabilizations and treatments and exposure to some of those sorts of things. And if you're somebody who is, say, maybe in charge of field safety or in charge of the medical response to an area, especially if you're working in really remote situations, um, the, the woofer is a great option. And I'd also encourage you to look at the Wilderness EMT, which is really just kind of a woofer plus the EMT skills shoved together. They are a month long, you know, 200 uh, plus hours um, for these, um, but it's a nice way to do it in a nice condensed setting. Um, these are some examples of organizations that teach these. There are a lot more out there conflict thrown up there. I do work for Knowles Wilderness Medicine, so I have opinions about who you should go with, but they're all, they're all valid. We, we all get along and we recertify each other's uh, students. Um, so if you have more questions about those and you want to talk more about one of those courses and what might be best for you or for your organization or folks that you work with, um, by all means, please reach out. Um, that's how you reach out. And thanks for having me. And I'm happy to answer any questions that folks have. I'm gonna pull up the chat. Oh, full body hives, yikes. Um, epinephrine can be expensive. It depends on insurance. Um, it, there are programs out there to make it more affordable. Um, there's also the ability to carry it, to be able to draw it up from an ampule or a multi-dose vial, which is an option in some areas. Um, yeah. Can I, can I just ask a quick question kind of following on from that? Please. So talking, so thinking about that, um, this is always something I think about because I'm a, a PI at a university. Are there ways, I'm sure there are, but, but how would you approach like the university about um, providing those things like free you know and and it sounds like a simple thing like go and ask them Jen but like we know that that often doesn't work so how would you yeah what what advice would you give there do you know what I mean are you talking specific to epinephrine or the training things uh, oh both both because I have a I've never but this whole epipen thing is really useful actually because I've actually never thought about that um, there are students in my team who carry those, but they have them, you know, themselves. I have approached university about doing um, wilderness training for sure. Um, they're in the process of, of thinking about that. Um, uh, but beyond that, you know, I, I feel sometimes a little bit powerless because I want to provide these things for students in my lab and, and my team. Um, but getting them done is, I found it hard, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I would say there's a couple of things that come to mind. So one specific to you in San Antonio, I don't know if you know that there is a, um, there's an emergency medicine residency program at UT mm -hmm. Health San Antonio, and they have a huge wilderness medicine presence. Um, and I, uh, I would tap into that and I'd be happy to connect you with, with folks. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, and yeah. that you could get some in-person training. I know that they, um, they, they love doing outreach. Um, you know, I, I think really the, the folks to involve, I mean, just the, like the risk management 
folks at the university. Because I think when you take like your, say like your risk management plan or your, your safety plan, things like that, and you put it in front of them and you say like, hey, these are the things that like you're expecting us to do, but look at all these risks. Also, here's a training that helps to fill some of those gaps. And I think you take it to that level. Um, in terms of epinephrine, it does get a little bit tricky depending on the, the institution. Um, so I know that a lot of people do fight this battle and fight very, very hard and get nowhere because of bureaucracy. Um, and so that one's a very specific, like organization specific question, but really it ends up being the same thing of like you put out the knowledge of, you know, like I, like I can go to organizations and I can say, yes, you have students who come that have documented allergic reactions, they bring their own EpiPen, but what about somebody who's never had the allergic reaction before? And it's possible that somebody, their first reaction is going to be life-threatening. Um, and it's just, it's a pretty standard thing. And it just, it takes coaxing and helping people realize that we're, we're trying to walk back all those years and years of being afraid of, of EpiPens. there a hand raised? Yeah, I think Tim's got a question. Please. Tim's here and he does have his, his hand up. And, uh, and, and Jen, you know, to address your question uh, and our societies, we're constantly wondering or asking about what more can we do to help support ornithologists uh, from, from our societies? And maybe one thing we can do is help le leverage some resources for universities so that they can have some of these resources. And then let's, let's take the money part off the table for something like that, and then just be dealing with the university bureaucracy. I'd be open to uh, receiving proposals of that nature, uh, and I'm sure our friends with the FO would as well. Um, yes, there is a certification course to carry to minister epinephrine. So right now the, the legal statute only exists in North Carolina and California. There are other states that are working on it. Um, and depending on like your actual work capacity, um, there are some like supervisory positions, um, within, especially within governments, but sometimes within private organizations that are also allowed to carry. I mean, the most basic one that they, that were was like the baseline for all this were bus drivers. Um, and so like in many, many states, bus drivers were like, well, you're alone with kids for, you know, a couple hours a day, potentially like we need to train you and head administer an EpiPen. Um, so it just depends on where the, where you're located. Um, and you just have to look at the local statutes for that. I threw my email into the chat. Please feel free to reach out with any additional questions. Um, birds are real. I do know that. And it is a fantastic conspiracy theory. It's so much fun. I know that it's, it's meant to be a joke. So. <laughs> it's a good one. Mm -hmm. Do we have any more questions? Ariel had to leave. I think people are hopping off now. They've hit that 5 p.m. on a Friday point, <laughs> at least for the East Coast. Um, yeah, and if there are no more questions, does Jen or Tim, anyone? Any oh, no, I think um, one last minute thing, I, it was mentioned in the chat, but what I forgot to mention, and Anthony raised this, uh, was legalities and things around MACE. Um, so if you're going to use that uh, as a way uh, to potentially navigate safety situations be very clear about the state and federal rules about what you're buying and how you can use it also it's sometimes tricky to get over customs so that can yes international don't address. fly with it i've <laughs> had that pro i've had that with bear spray don't yeah. do it don't get compensated in, in country but all i'm saying the folk in anchorage must have a lot of bear spray <laughs> yes including mine <laughs> 
All right, well, um, just to let you know, we are recording this. So after this is over, we will try fast to um, get it sent out to everyone and some of those resources that were promised in the chat. Um, yeah, so thanks for joining us. And Justin, Dr. Doroshenko, thank you for that excellent presentation. We really appreciate it. It was, I wasn't sure what you would highlight, but that was excellent. So thank you. It was my pleasure. Best of uh, best of luck to all of you this season, and yeah, be safe out there. But have fun. Keep doing the keep doing the good work. You too. <laughs> all right.